Wow. You haven't seen me for a long time, my wife. I was here last week, oh. And you miss me. The feeling is mutual. Wow. It feels nice. The feeling was very nice as the clapping was getting louder. And <laughs> wow. I think it's a nice feeling to feel loved and missed. So I think husbands, we have to learn oh, because that feeling is good, but that's what wives like. And that's what you think is not necessary. But it's very necessary. I feel like preaching already. <laughs> wow. Father, thanks a million for the wonderful privilege we have to be in your house, to fellowship together with your Holy Spirit around your word. Please open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of your law. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Please be seated. The revelation of the Good Samaritan and others. The Good Samaritan and others. It's, there's a revelation. It is a revelation that God wants you to experience. Just to remind you, um, is it this week, next week, right? The conference. We still have two weeks. Next week, Sunday. Oh, next week, end. Okay. All right. Our mega church conference is coming up. And... Um, We, 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 we usually have conventions, and every now and then we have conferences. Conferences are different. Now, a Higam conference, a Higam conference is a convention where we come to celebrate the word of God and we come for God to minister to us so that we can feel blessed and happy. And it's a very wonderful experience we have all the time at these Higam conferences. That is, um, he gave gifts unto men conferences. So it's a lot of celebration. Now, a conference is a different kind of, maybe as you say, a leadership conference or a work for God conference. It's different from that type. So if you are listening on Sweet Melodies, Dofopa FM, Facebook or YouTube, I'm just extending a right hand of fellowship and invitation to you to attend our uh, mega church conference coming up on the, on the 26th of April at 6 p.m., 27th of April at 9 a.m., and then 28th of April at 4 p.m. Am I getting the times correct? Very good. So make sure you are here. Uh, myself will be ministering. Uh, Bishop Emmanuel Louis in Tefo will be here also ministering powerfully. He's, he's um, in a sense, a professor of church growth. Has written two major books on church growth. Maybe three major books in, because the Holy Spirit is also the agent and the um, main agent of church growth. So three major books on church growth. And how we can be blessed serving God and making his church grow. And our church, we must believe God for it to grow beyond what you are enjoying right now. And I believe that there are, there's more room. So God is going to bless us. So this conference is for all of us. It's for pastors, it's for shepherds, and for serious Christians and non-serious Christians. So in case you are not such a serious Christian, maybe you are just a nominal church-going type. So Sunday morning you arrive, but beyond that, that's it. That's a nominal Christian. You are the type of people who fill it on your forms. That's all. Christian, Muslim, or others, then you say Christian. 
That's nominal. But we are talking about practicing proselytes. Is that <laughs> proselyting the Christianity and making it practical and real? Where when you hear the things that are preached, it's not just that you are attending to mark your register, but it's actually a time where you are, you know, practically implementing. When it's they preach about prayer, it makes you pray. When they preach about area fellowships, it makes you attend, host, participate. If they preach about evangelism, you embark on evangelism. If they preach about quiet time, reading your Bible every day and praying, you actually do it. If they preach about um, uh, husbands, you know, loving wife, wives, you, 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 you try. <laughs> You try to do it, you know. And um, when uh, they preach about wives loving, serving, respecting, and revering husbands, you actually, actually practically try all your life till you die. It is your avowed intent to practicalize what you are experiencing. So I want to believe God that uh, wives that are here, husbands that are here, when you hear God's word, it will change your life. So that's a, a Christian who is not just a nominal Christian, but somebody who is a practicing, active, and um, yes, something demonstrable. If they preach about tithing, it's like I can never eat money that comes to me if it's an income or a blessing from some other source. If it's my salary or something. The Christian is like he's, he's going to force. It's like for the rest of his life he'll do it. Yeah. If they preach about, what else do they preach about that you can do? If they preach about what? Holiness. Oh. Your life will try. Uh, when you fall you feel bad. But there are some nominal Christians. When you are a nominal Christian, if they preach about holiness, it's like you are not the type that hears such things. Like you don't hear such a message can never be preached to you because, hey, how will I live? I have to survive. Yes, I have to live. It, it can never, it's like, <laughs> are there people who do such things in this modern world? Honestly, maybe these are Old Testament admonitions, but in our modern world, things are different. As a young girl, I need a sponsor. And, and, and these small, small boys that are my mates, they can't help me. I need somebody who is already established, has money, and can spread me. Look at the way the weather is hot. How can I stay in an apartment that is hot like that? I cannot survive. I need a sponsor to air condition me. And if I have to, you know, every now and then help him here, the left hand bats the right hand, and the right hand also bats the left hand. So honestly... Um, that's how my life, and I can never change it. So please, you can preach, but I don't, I don't, I, I won't do it. If they preach about forgiveness, it's like you force that, as they have preached about forgiveness, you start looking into your life. Is there somebody I am bitter about than somebody I hold a grudge or have not forgiven? Hey, you see the believer, you see, the, the, I'm talking about practicing Christianity. It makes you start to look. And, but there are many Christians in churches. Do you see? If they preach about forgiveness, that, no. Hey, Kai, that guy, he showed me. Pa, he has gone to marry somebody and now he is happy and I'm sitting I should forgive him. Never. Then if I am a doctor and he comes to my clinic, I will inject him to he will die. <laughs> if I'm the nurse looking after him, in the, he's finished. I will change the dosage and man, massage the medicine I'm giving him till he, 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 he cannot breathe again. Foolish boy. If I'm, if I'm at a restaurant and I'm the wait waitress, he's finished. Ah, I will spit into his head. I will wee-wee and smear it on the food for him so that he can eat it. It's like, and yet he's a Christian. If they preach about loyalty and honesty and faithfulness, is that me? I never would do such a thing. Kai, I work for this woman, monkey, they work baboon, they chop. I will make myself happy and rich. Ah, I'm not a fool. 
And I, I feel, I don't know whether it's true, but I feel sometimes you go and buy something, then they will tell you that the POS doesn't work. The machine doesn't work. So Momo it to me, add charges, and then I will, I will push it. They don't push it. <laughs> and if you are here, you see you are a Christian or you are in, the, you are in somebody's uh, shop. And this is how you conduct yourself. That you are not a proper practicing Christian. You are a butro bojo, wishy-washy, lukewarm, nominal Christian who is likely, very likely, you may not go to heaven. It's very possible from this way of life that you will not make it to heaven, unfortunately. That's why Jesus says that some people come and say, I came to church in your name. I give offerings in your name. He said, depart from me. I know you not, for you are workers of iniquity. Are you listening to me? So, brothers and sisters, I'm talking about the conference coming up that it is for pastors, it's for shepherds. Shepherds are serious Christians who also help to look after other Christians. Then serious Christians, you are not a shepherd, but... You take God seriously. You take church seriously. You are a serious Christian. And then those of you are just described, nominal. You don't really practice the Christianity. You, that conference too is for you. Maybe a few people may be affected in some positive way. If they even church service, there's a conference. It's like a nominal Christian doesn't think that. After I've come to church on Sunday, expect me to come back here on Friday. It's like uh, me. It's like come again. Why? I have other things to do, eh? I've given you Sundays enough. Ask your neighbor, are you a nominal Christian or a serious Christian? Ask him, which type are you? Which type are you? Which type are you? And which type did he say he is? He is a nominal Christian. He says he's a nominal Christian. Hey! Everybody is pushing himself towards the serious Christian for Jesus. So, make sure you register and attend. The conference is a paid-up conference. And make sure you register and then you attend. The QR code is on the screen. Use your phone to take the... These days, the modern way things are brought to your phone, QR code. So, you use your normal phone when you take a picture of it. If your, 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 your phone cannot do that, it means that it's very, 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 very old. And my... <laughs> say amen. <laughs> Bishop Asse says, I should tell you to say amen. <laughs> and change that phone right there. All right. Beautiful. Now, today, for a brief moment, I want us to look at Luke chapter 10. And we read from verse 25. Let me calm down. I feel like preaching. So let me calm down so I can preach very fast. Yes, please. In Luke chapter 10, we read from verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Are you following the reading? Yes. Ask your neighbor, are you a nominal Christian or a serious Christian? Of course, nominal Christians, they don't, they don't like taking Bibles to church and lo- they don't like taking notes. And they don't like reading. When they say, shall we read? Or we are reading the scripture, they just, they just look at the preacher's dress. <laughs> Teacher, what shall I do? I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. 2020 edition. The 2015 is a little different. Verse 26, he says, And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? Jesus asked him. And he answered Jesus, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28, and he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And who is my neighbor? Almost rudely. And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, a man 
was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he encountered robbers. And they stripped him and beat him. And went away leaving him half dead. And by coincidence, a priest was going down on that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these these three, do you think, proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said to Jesus, the one who showed compassion to him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Hallelujah. Amen. Number one, the good Samaritan cares about others. I'm preaching about others and the good shepherd, the good Samaritan story is going to give us some revelation about others. Okay? And the first thing we notice is that a good Samaritan or the good Samaritan, he cares for others and not only himself. Remember the message about others is about other people who are not in your regular um, circle of family, friends, school colleagues. They are not your immediate neighbors you actually are flowing with, but others beyond that circle. All right? And the Bible says that this good Samaritan, he cared about the man who was on the Jericho road. The priest passed by and pretended that nothing had happened to the man. He just went. Priest. Sofu. Man of God. Perhaps wearing his collar. <laughs> the Levite, who is also a religious man, also came by and didn't bother. He rather crossed. It's like maybe he was on the same side where the man was lying. When he noticed the man moaning and groaning, and realized that he's a beating man. He said, hey, Charlie, they are beating people here. <laughs> he crossed to the other side and continued on his journey. Yes. Not caring about the man, but the good Samaritan. And I think in this story, this man coming down from Jerusalem must be a Jew. Because Jews travel down to other cities. But other cities, they go up to Jerusalem. That's why he says he went, down, he went from Jerusalem to, down to Jericho. Yes. But there are times when he says that he, even the psalmist says that it is, uh, Jerusalem is built as a city uh, whether the tribes go up. They go up to Jerusalem. Actually, when you go to Jerusalem, you see that it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's on a hill. And... and there are many turns, turns, and uh, then you turn a particular curve, then you see this glorious mansion. It's like a mansion, but it's actually a city. It's walled like that. The Bible says it's compact together. Yes, it's together like one city is like a block that is together, and it has gates. Yes. You see, the, and then when the tour, most of the tour guides, they are not really Christians but they know what we believe. So they start playing this John Stan song. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
Da 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 da, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to the King. You see, you don't even know that song, but the play is there and it's very appropriate for that time because as soon as you turn the curve and you see the the city, because it's very glorious. Because everywhere is desert, then when you turn a particular cab, here is this, as if it's a mansion on a hill with high walls and large gates shining gloriously. Then you hear this sound, Jerusalem. And it's like, hey, the person has timed it for us to meet Jerusalem at the right time. And it's very, the feeling is very nice. It, they, they really do it very well and then it really works on us. Pa. Then we've, we've become emotional. <laughs> then the man doesn't believe in God, in, in, in Christ, but he has encouraged us to come and enjoy the Holy Land. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Yeah. So he went down from Jerusalem and then he was going down to Jericho and he met these robbers and they beat him. But when the good, the, the, we say good Samaritan, because he is not a Jew. If you remember when Jesus met the woman of Samaria, she was also a Samaritan. She told Jesus that the Samaritans have no dealing with the Jews. From that passage, we know that the Samaritans have no dealing with the Jews. So if somebody who is traveling from Jerusalem, a Jew, is going and a Samaritan meets him, he rather has a right not to even touch him. Because they don't, like those of you who are fantasy, you, when your daughter or son comes that he has found a beloved, is an away. You say, hey! Your immediate reaction is, ah, why? <laughs> Uncle Sam! <laughs> you see. Because even those of us who are in Ghana, you, you are in that particular tribe, you don't really flow. And if you are an away, even when you are looking for a beloved, you don't look in the way of Fantis and Ashantis. Often when the girl is maybe uh, Mau, Mause or Maus, Mau, Maushi, 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 Mausi, yeah, Mausi. There's also Mause. Yes. And is that also? There's also Mause. One is I, the other is E. They are all working. When you, when you are Mause or Mausi, you are looking for another Mauli. So when it's Mauli, you are warmer than if he comes and says it's Abebrese or it's Osekweku. <laughs> or, or, or you, are, you are looking for Mauli. When the person says, oh, it's Mauto. Or when you hear the accent and you realize that, wow, the accent is very powerful. Yes, I do. <laughs> You see that you are, you are, your, your spirit brightens up. But this Osel Kwejo and Kwekufuri who are passing by, that you are not really warm till maybe the person has to demonstrate some very supernatural, out of this world wealth and cleverness and superior raps to charm you. Hey, you cannot easily get an Ewe girl. She's looking for her own Nyebro. And if it's an Ewe brother, Kai, they are even worse because they they, they like their apple, hair and fetri de chi. Hey, ewe man. No matter how educated, don't take it for granted. If you are married to an ewe man, his mind is on his apple. Don't say, oh, he he, he, he lived in, he grew up in a crowd, so he doesn't like. The day he goes for a funeral at Anyako, you will see something. That's when you see that himself has come. Say, ah, I thought you don't eat this. <laughs> yeah, leave me, leave me, leave me. This is my favorite food. Because you are not making it. He has also pretended that he doesn't like it. Anyway, so my point is that the good Samaritan, who is not related biologically, he is not related tribally or nationally, do you understand, to this person, and has no dealing with the person, yet he cared for him. That's the first thing that you must notice. Okay? So like the good Samaritan, 
Mm? I must also care about others. Say that after me. Like the good Samaritan, I must care about others. Number two, the good Samaritan interrupted his journey because of others. Most people are not prepared to interrupt their busy schedules or their holidays to help others. Most people will say, I don't have any money to help. But they always have enough money to go on expensive trips. But the good Samaritan, he was going on his journey. The priest didn't want to interrupt his journey to care for somebody who was dying on the Jericho Road. Because to step out of your line and go to somebody who is in need, eh, you may have to every now and then interrupt your own journey so that you can be a help to others. It's not because you don't have anything to do. It's not because you are idle. It's not because you have no vision that you are tending to others. But it's because a good Samaritan, eh, he can interrupt his own journey and care for others and look after others and attend to others. Are you listening to me? So the next thing you can also say is that like the good Samaritan, say that after me, like the good Samaritan, I must interrupt my journeys because of others. I can interrupt my journeys because of others. I will interrupt my journeys because of others. Number three, the good Samaritan poured the oil and wine into others. He found the man bleeding and dying on the Jericho road. Then he took the wine and he took the oil and he poured it. I don't know what type of medical practice that is, but maybe in those days, all our modern things were not working. But I think even when you, you get hurt, at least on movies, I've seen people pouring wine. Like they drink small. It's like I've got some small bottle of wine. Have you seen that thing before? Like alcohol, very sharp one. Then he drinks a little. He says, I can't drink or I need to pour some on my wound. I think to disinfect it. Eh? Very good. It's a type of, in those days, they used a lot of uh, methylated spirits. I think people drink that thing too, do they? They also drink it to just, it's not supposed to be drunk, but some people who are not well, they drink it to get high. Hey! Hey, yeah, my boy. The Samaritan poured the oil and the wine. And I think in our modern, having followed the Lord for some time, you can see in the Bible, the oil represents the Holy and the wine represents the blood. Actually, every day when we take communion, we lift up the wine and we say, this is the blood. Okay? And then when we are at Higam conferences, there's always, there are always bottles of oil aplenty. Because we need to oil ourselves. Yes. Why? Because oil use represents, not, not that it represents, but it's a token that we use anytime we are invoking the power of the Holy Spirit to come to bear on our lives. So if, we're, if we, we just, just for the sake of a little analogy, extrapolate these tokens, the man, the good Samaritan's journey, then we can say that he poured, he, 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 ex, he made the man experience the power of the blood and also experience the power of the Holy Spirit. In this life, you too can pour oil and wine in the lives of many. When Jesus met Maria, um, by the time he finished with her, she had come to experience Jesus as the Messiah and experience him as the Savior. She left her water pot went to the town and came to the people and said, I've seen a man who told me all that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? She had received salvation. So salvation through the blood, through the blood, you can serve to others. Others need salvation. You too can pour salvation. Jesus told the woman that anybody who drinks of this water you are drinking shall test again 
but the water that I shall give shall be in him a well of water springing to everlasting life. That means that when you have salvation, it can be a, a be all in all solution for all your physical needs in this life. That once you have Jesus, that's why they sing a song, say me what, say me what, me what, me what, yes, me what, yes, me what, yes, me what, me Ao yesue, o hini yesue, o sombo, senazi nina. O sombo means that he's, he's what? Eh? He's precious. sufficient, he's precious, more than anything else. Namushu yesua, mashazi nina. Start from the top. Start from the top. Minya ya senyo maninara. Minya ya senyo maninara. Namashu yesua. Mashrazi nina. Mewo yesua. Mewo nina. Osombo chena zinina. Is it a fanti or a chi song? It's fanti. Uh, but we can sing the fanti as if they are singing chi. Okay. Do you understand? Well, that, that means that if I have Jesus, I have everything. But you see, maybe we don't have Jesus well. That's why it seems like after Jesus, you still need to go high and be high. After Jesus, you still need a girl. After Jesus, you still need a boy. After Jesus, you still need money. After Jesus, you still need to go out to America or something to be happy. It's like once you don't have these things, it's like you are not really happy. But actually in Jesus, I tell you that without a boyfriend, you can be happy. Without a husband, you can be happy. Without a girlfriend, you can be excited. Without a boyfriend, you can be on top of this world. Oh yes. You haven't been to America before, but you are happier than people who even live in America. You see, when you have Jesus properly, you don't have Jesus well. That's why a lot of times almost as if I don't have, you know, you are, you are in Jesus, you have Jesus, but it's like I don't have a beloved, then you are dying. When you come, you are not happy. Do you see you are bored with everybody, ashes, everyone. It's like, free hot no more. It's like, get a foolish boy. Do you know who I am? Eh? This morning I've not eaten. Before you come, you tell me to go and sit on the other side. Do you know how far I've come before I'm getting it? Stupid boy, get out of my way. It's like you are not happy. It's like you need other things, but Jesus can satisfy you. Oh, yes. Yes. Jesus. Paul wrote and said, Christ in you is the hope of glory. It's like the finality of your search is Christ in you. Say amen. amen. So believe God to get to that point. Say, Godliness with contentment is great gain. When you have Christ and you are content, it's like you are not thinking of I mean, that's why you can't even pay tithe because you always think of something you need and must have. So it makes you not so happy serving the Lord. Hey! You don't have air conditioning, so you have to squeeze your face. You don't have this, you, have, you don't have this, you have squeezed your face. You don't have money in your pocket, you have squeezed your face. Hey, don't come and say, hey, hey. some husbands will just squeeze their faces and just move out of the house. I don't ask me any questions <laughs> because they are broke. Ah, bah! You may not have money, but joy can fill your heart because you have what? Jesus inside of you. Oh, yes. He is the, he is the satisfier of our lives. Yes. And what people need in this world, they don't need cars, they don't need houses, they don't need electricity. What is the real need of man is Jesus Christ. If we can believe it, if we can believe it, Jesus is really the answer to the world today. Yes. So you can pour in the wine, the blood, that man will come into that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You too, you have 
the, the wine in your hand, pour in the wine, pour in the oil, the Holy Spirit. Those in this world who are ministering, the, the Bible talks about something called ministering. He that, Galatians 5, he that ministereth the Spirit. He that ministereth, the Spirit is also somebody you can minister to people. And when you minister the Spirit, eh, it brings great changes into the lives of people. That's why Jesus said that we must pray for the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, he is a great power. When he comes into your life, he will revolutionize everything. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Pour in the oil and the wine. And the people who minister the Spirit are very powerful in our midst in our lives today. The pastors, the apostles, the evangelists, the prophets who are ministering the spirit. You see crowds gathering. You see people getting solutions. Children, uh, 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 barren women receiving children. Oh yes, the sick getting healed. They are ministering the power of the Holy Ghost. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with power. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil ministering to the hearts of depressed people. Somebody said, if it was not for Bishop Eddie, I would have gone mad. <laughs> because by the preaching, by the teaching, by the fellowship, by the worship, by the prayers, oh, depression just leaves your life. I am ministering the spirit. When you are ministering the spirit, you become a solution to your world. We must pour in the oil and the wine. Pour in the oil and the wine. Pour in the oil. Tell your neighbor, let's pour in the oil into other people. The good Samaritan, he did it for the man. Maybe it looked like he was healing physical wounds. But it's, it's a spiritual kind of analogy that Jesus is giving to us. You are only living for yourself. But the good Samaritan, he pours in the oil and the wine. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Others need the wine. Others need the, 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 the oil. Oh, yes. And by God's grace, you and I will also be there to pour the oil and pour in the wine into the lives of people. Look at what I'm doing. I am pouring the oil and pouring the wine into you. Depression is living. Sickness is living. Oh, yes. I, I, I myself, I may even have my own problems, but I'm not thinking about my problems. I'm thinking about you. As I'm ministering to your needs, even God turns my captivity around. When I'm ministering to you, as I'm helping you, God will help me. As I bring healing, God will bring healing to my life. And God turned the captivity of Job when he ministered and he prayed. Friends, are you so inward looking into yourself? Every day crying. You see, how come your life is not exciting? Everybody has marital problems. But if you ever, if you lifted your eyes over your marital and looked at other people and encouraging them, even how to choose a husband, encouraging somebody, a young foolish girl whose mind is not working well. Because you, you can see a foolish girl when you see one. Now you can see one whose mind is not working. That now her mind is like a small chicken that cannot think. As is following this boy who gives her twenty cities to buy chicken. Do you see? And and you can see that a foolish girl is moving in town, and you think only of your own marital problems. So you never stretch your hand to help another. The guy buys her, her indomie. Oh, indomie. This indomie is what? Some type of spaghetti. Noodles. Oh. With sardine inside. Ah. And pepper. What? Lift your eyes away from your own marital issues. And look at the foolish girls that are moving in town. And say, my daughter, I was there. I've been there. I've been there. I've seen this type of thing before. This is how it begins. This is how it manifests. They, then say, hey, you are a prophet. He actually told me what you are saying yesterday. Say, eh. Then you say more things. Oh, yes. So after that, he's going to say this. So watch out. Then the next day, the girl says, hey. Yeah. The woman has showed me this man. Then she'll become wiser and save herself. Pour in the oil. 
Where is your oil? Where is your oil? Where is your oil? Where is your oil? Why are you not lifting your eyes away? Eh? Jeff, you may think that you have problems, but I tell you, there are others who have problems. You have oil, you have wine, you must pour it into their lives to bring a change into their lives. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Life has more meaning when you live for others. Life has more meaning. There are people who just even to come and stand in front of the church and say, you are welcome. You are welcome. I, I can't do something like that. I just come and sit down. I don't want to do anything. Look at communion stars. I mean, some I think about their work. I say, ah. you see, the, the boxes that they've shared, they've, they, 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 they've arranged the communion. Some people come, let's say on Saturday, then they come and prepare everything. Then they put it together. On Sunday, somebody just baths, comes, dresses, comes to church, walks to the back there, picks a tray of maybe tea, wafers and 20 glasses and then he says okay or stands in the lobby when you come they give you one they give you one that's communion that work and umpo, you can't do for God it's like just to help others to drink communion you can't do just I want to just come and sit down that's why I say they are nominal Christians no matter what you preach in faith <laughs> I'll just come for Sunday and listen to Bishop. Oh, Christianity is to listen to Bishop preach. Once he has preached, I've finished. And whatever he says in the preaching, it's not something that I will do because it's not all the things that I can do. That must, that must be done. Bishop, he says a lot of things. He likes giving instructions. Who did me and all my instructions? When he's full, then he's full of instructions. No problem. Nominal Christian. Say this after me. Like the good Samaritan, I will pour the oil and wine into others. Like the good Samaritan, I must pour the oil and the wine into others. Like the good Samaritan, Yes, I must pour. I will pour. I should pour. I can't just be there without thinking about it. That story is not just a nice story that, oh, when now on the news they see that somebody, uh, maybe like you see sometimes, I've, I've watched a few of these videos where somebody's in a car, he collapses. Then the car is going and uh, it doesn't stop. Then some people around, they call them good Samaritans. You see, well, what is it? The man is in his car. The car is moving. You can see that this car is going red light. It doesn't stop. It's going now. Uh, and the person who is behind the steering seems to have slammed over and is unconscious. So you are in your car. You are normal. Everything is okay. So do you continue on your journey or you turn aside, stop your car and go and see what you can do to help somebody? So we call such people good Samaritans in the news. But in the church, Jesus gave that parable or that story to wake you up to think about others. Yes, and to see that your life cannot be just about yourself, your biologically related people or colleagues, but also you must think about others, work for others, and help others. Pour in the oil and the wine for others. You see, there are people who are not even employed. If this revelation hits your heart, eh, and you start to think, what can I do? To help others. You'll be surprised that you come up with a brilliant idea. That can bring you prosperity. But you are thinking. Somebody should come and employ me. And just give me money. When they employ you and you go to the job. to Just sleeping. And lying down. And a man is very unreasonable. He doesn't want us to rest. If you rest small. If you rest small. You see the rest small that you are talking about. You say small. But it's money for the person. It's counting money. He has deadlines to meet. As he goes for meetings, they are facing him. How come you said two weeks? Now it's now two weeks, ten days. You have not been able to finish. What are you doing? We are going to cancel the contract. You don't hear such meetings. So you come to the office and you are coming to bed. The man will come and say, hey! What means that old sleeper? Foolish, but get up. Look, write a query. Then they write you a query. Then they sign big words. 
red letters before you are now shouting that hey, they should sack you. <laughs> Somebody should just employ and just give you money, give you money. Then when you are working for him to, you they, you say they should send you the money. You momo, you send the money. Meanwhile, you not send. They've been sending you. Uh, it's on your mom. Your mama is even full. And you have bought land from, with somebody's business. Telling him that these days they, they are, you are selling fuel. They buy the fuel oh, because he cannot go into the tank to go and stand in and, and use his height to measure, <laughs> to measure the height of the fuel that is downstairs. You say it's full. Then he says it's finished. When he calculates how much has come in and how much he used to buy the fuel that was put in the tank, he sees that he has, he has a shortfall of about 25,000. He said, ah, how come we've lost 25,000 this month? Hey, I don't know. This day they say some leakage. leakage There's no leakage. You are the leakage. Say after me, like the good Samaritan. Like the good Samaritan, I will pour the oil and the wine into others. Number four, the good Samaritan did not give excuses when he had to care for others. He did not give excuses. You should listen to the excuses of people, you know, when they are not caring for others or the excuse when they, they don't want to care for others. You should listen to the excuses that they give for not reaching out to the lost of our world. But the good Samaritan did not give excuses to, con to continue to, to not uh, to continue on his journey. Excuses to continue. Like, I must just go because look, I'm late. Oh, uh, it's not uh, convenient. Hey, Charlie, to delay me. Hey, it will do. If you watch Jesus, Every time he, if, if Mark chapter 5 particularly is of note, in Mark chapter 5, it begins with the encounter with the madman of Gadara. When he finished, eh, he was there when Jairus, Jairus came to call him that his daughter is nigh unto death, that Jesus should come and heal her. When Jesus was on his way, then came the woman with the issue of blood. Jesus didn't say that, look, somebody's daughter is on, on the, at the point of death and you are coming to waste my time. You to receive some of the virtue. I have an emergency. I can't attend to you. Jesus himself is a good Samaritan and those who are following him must be good Samaritans. Yeah. Are you there still or you've gone home? Okay. Don't give excuses. We are full of excuses. I can't go because of this. Hey, my, my, this thing, my, this, look. Ha. Huh. Now, looking at my face, you are smiling. <laughs> full of excuses. I have not done my hair. I have not done this. Meanwhile, when something is important to you, you haven't done your hair, you have a wig, you put it on. You have wigs. Wig, you don't need hairdo. You just tie something. Even your hair cry is short. So if there's no even, it's not a problem like that. It's like your hair is short already. So it's like a, a cap. You just. Even you don't need a comb. Your own hair, your own hand. It can, it can be a comb like that. Within 30 seconds, you are ready to go out. But when it comes to God and his house, people are getting, we need salvation, we need to visit orphans, we need to do something. Oh, and by God, the grace of God, through the leadership of our prophet, Bishop Daguard Mills, he has tried to make our minds go, God, typical Ghanaians, we don't think about others. We only think of they should bring us aid. Development partners should bring us this. Oh, our donor friends. Meanwhile, what do you donate to those friends? And what development partners? do you bring to those partners? It's you just collecting, 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 collecting. But it's not time to lift your eyes above your own troubles, above your own needs, and look at the needs and the troubles of others and the salvation that must come to others and the help others need and say, I'm part of it. 
So look at, look at, go and look at the orphanage that we have there because he's thinking about others. There are other children who don't have a home. Let's create a home. And it was not just normal, typical orphan, orphanages, um, dormitory style. All the children are in dormitories. But he said, no. I want these children to experience home life, where family life, where there's a father, there's a mother, they go to school, outside they come back, so there's a bath that takes them to school, brings them back. There's a father of the home, a mother of the home, and they take and volunteers. People have also volunteered their lives to look after these children. They are mothers who are there. They have their own biological family. They've left them and have gone to the orphanage. To live there with these children who have no parents. Because you have children who have parents. You are parents to other children. But there are other children who don't have parents. But I say, I can be a father and mother to other people also. And they are doing it. And they are doing it. And we, when we are in this church, we say, this my lady here, 2nd June. 22nd June. We are going to the orphanage. We are going there. We will be going there. And I want to encourage you. Add me. I want to, even I'm not, you are not going to, what are you going to do, weed or clean? You are not going to, you are just joining a group that are going from this church to go and donate. Do you have to give anything? You don't have, you have to. These are all opportunities God gives us to serve others. Do you understand? Giving to God is not only your offering and your tithe. Giving to God can be given for other specific needs and issues. Yes, that's why we give specific. We are building a church here. We give to that. We are building something here. We can give to that. Look at uh, uh, the children. We go there. We give them. I don't know what do we give them. We give them things. Sometimes they tell us they need. I think the last time they needed a fridge. Why not? Because your children go to the. Even my grandchildren, they open fridge. My grandchildren open fridge. And the other children who can never ever have an experience where they walk into a home where there's a fridge to turn it. Oh, and you'll be there thinking that, oh, my children, they are my children. They say, oh, hey, you want chocolate? Okay. There's some, there's some chocolate. There's just chocolate in the fridge. Oh, give them some. And now go and take. Go and take. I'm Fanta. I'm Fanta. He said, go and take. Go and take. Hey, Ajoa, hey, Ekuya, hey, give them one of the day. Let them go. And he said, but, your, your, but other children also need Fanta. They also need to, they also sat in fun, I am Fanta, but there's nobody to give them a Fanta experience. There's nobody to give them a Coca-Cola experience. And Bishop Dark said, let's build a home for all these children. Yes. Every year. In fact, for some time we've been renovating, I don't know whether the project is even finished, but we renovated all the Cells in Accra, the district of Accra, cells. Yes. Renovating police cells, like counterbacks in Accra, police stations. Because if you are ever either misrepresented, misconstrued, lied about, and they eh, accused falsely or rightly or falsely or whatever, and they put you at counterback at Nima, and, eh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you'll be shocked. A small cell, a small room, small one like the, between the pulpit and where I'm standing. A small room like this. You will see 22 people in it. Yes. And their toilet is in the corner. Which is broken and old and cannot be flushed. And the toilet that they have been going is inside. They are all there fellowshipping with it. And Bishop Doug said, I'm not a prisoner but I've never been to counter back, but it's, Jesus said, when the last point I'll be giving if I get there, but if I don't get there, I'm giving it. And that our judgment will be based on our treatment of others. And Jesus said, I was in prison and you didn't come and visit me. I was hungry, you never fed me. I was naked, you never clothed me. I was a stranger, you never took me in. And he said, the, the, the people said, uh, when did we see you hungry and you didn't say oh because you didn't do it to the least of my brethren and what it is is that you can't even tell who is Jesus' brother or his brethren in themselves because there are some people who have gone to sleep but there are maybe there are believers who are Jesus' people you see, like you are also a believer but you work at somebody's you are, they haven't caught you yet but you are a thief 
If one, one day you are counter back, you are, you are Jesus is one of the least, it's like the least practicing believer that brother that Jesus has is in prison. He said, Jesus is there. I must go and visit him. So let's go and renovate. Or let's imagine that Jesus is, is in a cell, counter back. Let's go and renovate it. In case Jesus is the one who is put there, he will have a comfortable place to stay. That's why. That's why. And once every year, I think once a year, on Christmas Day, he encourages the church that he's pastoring, and which we must all join, to buy, he says, assume that Jesus is there, buy one papaya, because papaya is good because the rice is a lot, and the chicken thigh is very big. Uh, now they've reduced their size, okay. <laughs> it used to be plenty rice, because the rice is very good. Uh, now they prepare jollof. Uh, they prepare their jollof. Then they buy KFC. And they add the chicken to the jollof they are prepared. And chilled coke. It's like they have to chill the coke. And he stresses that the coke must be chilled. That Jesus will drink chilled coke. Jesus is in the counter back there. He will drink chilled coke. So Christmas day. Once you are sitting going for lunch with your children. At Imperial Peking. Bishop Doug has marshaled forces with hot jollof with KFC chicken. Do you understand? And chilled coke, chilled like it's been chilled almost to freezing level the day before. So that it's very cold. He told them that it must be very cold because coke is not cooked until it is chilled. <laughs> Those of you who drink warm coke, you are not getting a good experience. Anybody who goes, you see them asking for with lemon and ice. Yes. The chilled cook is very powerful. And they send it to all counterbacks all over Accra. You should see them in cars, boots of cars, driving all over, sharing, sharing, as though he himself is there. But you see, when your mind is on others, you are moved to do things for others. Yes. And and, and the Bible says that Jesus said, you didn't do this to go to, go to depart from me. Join the goats. Join the goats. Then he will say to the sheep, to my right, the sheep, you are the ones who took me in. You are the ones who gave me food when I was hungry. You are the ones who clothed me when I was naked. You are the ones who, when I was a stranger, you took me in. You are the ones, when I was in prison, you came and said, hey, the righteous will ask him that, when did we see you as a prisoner? This is Matthew 25. We, when, we, when did we see you as a prisoner and then we, went, we came to visit? He said, ah, if today we hear on Sweet Melodies, Dofupa FM, Joy FM, City FM, uh, Kiss FM, Kesben FM, Adum FM, Choice FM, Gold FM, Ogbonu FM, eh? Sunny FM, that Jesus is in the counter back at Nima, Jesus Christ, with his photo in the this thing that Jesus has come to Ghana, they have arrested him at the airport and sent him to Nima. Do you think this morning any pastor in his church will find congregation members in his church? Will there be even me, my or whether I'll get even one person to come and listen to me this morning? Even me, my or whether I'll be here. We'll all be tr trooping to Nima counter back to go and visit Jesus. The crowd that will be there. President uh, uh, Nana Kufuadu, he will never, he will say, what is happening in Ghana? What has happened? Why are there people? Because he also lives around that area. Why are there so many people here? So Jesus is uh, he himself cry, will, will move. He said, Motoke, he will say, hey, President is coming. Say, Jesus is at the counter back. I'm coming to visit him. He says that you are the sheep. You have done it. And because of that, now come and enter into my eternal kingdom. And they are shocked. That, ah, how come that you are receiving us into your eternal kingdom based on... Because we thought that if you give your life to Jesus and you are born again, that's when you go to heaven. But it seems like... But me, I don't understand everything about judgment. Even between God and the devil, I don't know the relationship. I thought I knew, but honestly, I get to a point where I wonder... Whether there's some kind of pact or arrangement that they didn't write in the Bible. But maybe it's not necessary for us to know. But there's a sort of arrangement that is there where God 
can have a service and Satan can come there. Then you ask the, the, the devil that, have you considered one of my servants? He said, oh, that guy, he, you have a fence around him. That's why. I said, okay, take away. God will tell him, take away the fence. You see that he will not. Ah, how is it possible? Why do you have such an arrangement? We, when we see, even the devil has not come to the church. We only hear that he is affecting our lives and we are praying in the church. Hey, we will shoot him down. We will, we, will, we will cut him into pieces. But you, dear, you have seen him physically and directly in your service. And you are having a dialogue. And he goes. Then you have another service. Then he comes. Then you ask him that your work, you know, how did he go? Hey. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand. I don't understand that relationship. And I don't want to ask any questions about it before I'm charged with some kind of high treason. With contempt of court. <laughs> Do you understand? I, I don't want to ask anything about it. Or Jesus has met a madman who is filled with demons. Then the demons who are from the devil, they ask Jesus that, can you put us in the pigs? And Jesus says, okay, you can go. Ah, why? I don't understand. The relationship, no. Mentias here. God, me, I thought that the, every relationship with the devil is bind, fire. Casting, cutting, destroying, binding, chitraying, and everything. Binding, shooting, pulling down, pouring fire. These are the things, but I didn't know that you can actually listen to a demon and just, uh, he wants to go into some pigs, somebody's business, that he has so many pigs, then you spoil the whole business because of the request of these demons. I, I, I don't understand it. I leave it to God. He knows what he's doing. I don't understand judgment. So I don't know what it is that it's not about salvation. It's not about blood of Jesus. It's not about his death and his sacrifice. It's not about himself, Jesus. But he says that when he, you, are, you see somebody, you cannot tell. So who is the least of Jesus' brethren? Who is in prison? Can you tell? Do you know? Do you, can you tell? You can't tell. But there are so many people somewhere preaching, they were arrested. Somewhere also Christians who nominal and this type of Christianity, so they have gone to do something to their boss, they've thrown them in and they are repenting in their, in their prison and crying to the Lord for salvation. They are all his children. I don't know what you want to say about that. But he says that because you visited them and because you clothed them and because you, 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 you fed them and because you, 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 you accommodated such strangers. Huh? He says, you have done it unto me and you deserve to come to where I am in my father's kingdom. It is very wild. Your judgment will be based on your treatment of others. There are other sinners who are on their way to hell. Jesus said, not Jesus, Ezekiel. He says, if you see a sinner, do you see in his sin, and you don't warn him, and he goes to hell, his blood will be required from your hand. And we are all sitting in the church. We know about hell. We, were, we know we are escaping hell. We know about the blood. We know about God's mercies and God's forgiveness. And yet, we see people who are doing evil things, and we say we will never go out and talk to them. I will never reach out and bring that soul. I'll never go out. I can't go out for Jesus. I can go out for my boy. I can go out for my girl. I can go out for my children. I can go out for my wife and my husband. But I can't go out for Jesus. Your life must be about others. I will live for others. I will serve others. In the mighty name of Jesus. And then number six now. But number five. The good Samaritan risked, risked his life for others. The good Samaritan risked, risked his life for others. Because the people who have tagged the, who have tagged that, uh, Samar, uh, no, the Jewish man who was coming from Jerusalem could have also attacked because they are also around still. They may still be around. You may never know. So it's always risky. It's always risky. Evangelism, do you see? People don't go and evangelize because sometimes it's risky. Sometimes it's dangerous. Sometimes it looks dangerous to come for a service. Sometimes it looks dangerous in the night to, to go out. Sometimes it looks dangerous to leave your house 
and leave. But we leave our home to go to work. We leave our home to go to school. We leave our home to even travel for some days. But as soon as you have to go for all night or do something for God, the, the excuse of the dangers in the area. Hey, and they, are, they raped somebody here the last time. Hey, they, they broke into somebody's house where he was not there. Suddenly those things come up. And then our good Samaritan behaviors just go away from us. But time has come for us to say to ourselves that we can risk our lives, risk our homes, risk our children for the sake of Jesus and for the sake of others. Number six. So say this after me. Like the good Samaritan, I must risk my life for others. Number six. The good Samaritan paid the price to care for others. The Bible says he gave the man two denarii and said, use this to look after. It must have been a lot of money. Because he's going for some days. For his medicine, for his food, and for his accommodation. And he left him there. It always costs. He paid the price to save the lost. He paid the price to help somebody. There will always be a price to pay when you want to reach out to others. Any kind of evangelism, any kind of working for God may involve, even the conference, we have to pay. It's not free. You register, you pay 50 Ghana. It's part of the conference, conference fee. There are many conferences you go, you pay $100. You pay $150. You and your whatever, then they reduce to 120 But it is, you pay. There is nothing we do for God that is free. And we must always be concerned, it must be free. If it's not free, I will not do it. If it's not free, I won't come. If it, then we are going to have a concert. Eh? We have a concert this year. We will charge. You will come because I'm going to bring all these no names that you have. And when they also come, they also must be given gifts and, and something to, to, to whatever before they go. Joe, Joe Metal and this type of Akese Brempon and this type of uh, who are the nice guys who have come to town? M.O.G. No money. Eh? Eh? Dinah Hamilton, no. Or him, I'm messy. Do you see? Uh, uh, the three girls, Crawford, and then Daughters of Glorious Jesus. If you bring them here, it's a no pay. And you have to come. You won't come. You will come. Oh, you will come. Because people in the area and different who are not our church, they will all come here. And you will say that you won't come because concert is also an experience. And this year, we are going to have a concert. You will pay to come. Yes. But you will come. Unless it's free, you will not go. Ah. Those of you who like free things, this type of internet, this thing to get free movies. <laughs> Say after me like the good Samaritan. I will pay the price to care for others. Then the good Samaritan did not pretend that he could not see the problem. May God have mercy on us. Don't say that nobody, nobody is, everybody, Ghana, Ghana, everybody is a Christian. Oh, Ghana, everybody is saved. No. You are, you are burying your head in the, in the sand. You are refusing to see the problems of others. The salvation needs of others. Oh, these orphanage people, I'm sure they are using the orphanage to get money. Sir, go and see. You are burying your head in the sand. That's why you don't know that there are people who have problems and issues that we must think about and solve for them without charge. Go to the, the, the Hope Center. Eh? We, St. Gamaliel Hospital, we have a hope center. The hope center gives free prosthetic arms and limbs to people. Free. Like you have an arm that is cut, then they give you an artificial one that you, at least it makes your hand look like normal. Their legs is, you can walk on it and wear shoe like a normal person. When you see them until they remove their trousers or something, you will never think that it walk normal, run, even there was a guy, he, he decided to run. He has these two legs 
that are prosthetic limbs. And he decided to join the normal people with their normal legs to run in the Olympic Games or one of those events. It's like he's also strong enough and they've given him legs that even though he doesn't have legs, he can jump like this. On your marks, guest said, 100 meters, 400 meters. Said, hey, he was contending with the normal people at a point like, no, we who have normal legs should be a bit faster than you. That's the only way that they beat him. But he was very fast. I don't think any of us here can run with him. Normal legs. Wears trousers, walks around, has married everything. He has a wife. Yes. I think one day they, they accuse him that he has killed his wife. I don't know whether it's true, but this time. And he has a wife, a home, everything. Normal. Bishop Dag has created a hope center to give free those type of nice legs, no, he has made it free for the people who don't have in Ghana here. In Ghana here. You don't go anywhere. That's why you don't know what is happening. Yes. Just criticizing. When you hear even somebody saying something bad about him, you just believe it without even checking. You will never ask any questions. Just, hey, I didn't know that they are like that. I, 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 honestly, I'm preaching a nice message. I don't want to say what I wanted to say to you. Tell somebody I've changed. Say to him, I've changed. So say this after me like the good Samaritan. I must not pretend that I cannot see the problems of others. I will not pretend that I cannot see the problems of others. I will not and I should not and I must not and I won't. Pretend that I cannot see the problems of others. And then the final point I gave was that your judgment will be based on your treatment of others. Now, seeing that your judgment will be based on your treatment of others, what must you do for others? You must care for others. You must think about others. You must make sacrifices for others. You must risk your life. You must interrupt your journeys to care for others. Is that not so? Beautiful. Clap for Jesus. <laughs> Think about this. Say this after me. Stand to your feet. Say this after me. I understand. I understand. Say it loudly. I understand, I understand. That, my that my judgment will be based, will be based on my treatment of others. Treatment of others. Therefore, Therefore, shout it out. Therefore, I must think about others. I must care for others. I must interrupt my journeys for others. I must pour the oil and the wine into others. I must stop giving excuses when I have to care for others. I must risk my life for others. I must pay the price to care for others. Ask your neighbor, where is your two denarii? Where is your money to care for others? The, the, the Samaritan, he pays. It's not today that we ask you to give money to the church. That is strange. They give, the good Samaritan, he gave money. You look after the man. I'm going, I don't know for how long, but even if I come and you have spent more than what I gave you, I'll pay the rest for you. What a blessing. That's why people pay for, for brothers to come to church in buses. That's why we give money to support orphans. That's why we give money to build churches elsewhere. That's why we give money. We give, we give, we give, we give, we give, we give, we give to support the work of God. And God will bless us as we do that. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Clap for Jesus. Ask your neighbor a very simple question. Are you a serious Christian or a nominal Christian? Like a practicing Christian or just a Christian in name? Ask your neighbor. Are you a, pra a serious practicing Christian or a Christian in name? You see, when you are nominal to and they say, ask somebody. You will not even ask because it's like... I mean, I'm not the type who talks to people in the church. I mean, why? Why? If you have preached to me, go home, go away. Don't come and tell me to do anything again. Oh, brother. Oh, brother. 
Oh, sister, you are changing today in the name of Jesus. Say like the good Samaritan, I will care for others. Others are on my mind. I am a good Samaritan because I have others on my mind. I will interrupt my journeys, my journeys, my journeys, my journeys. Clap for Jesus. Abigail, is that how you clap? Hey. Fantastic. Let us pray. Father, thanks a million for your sweet word that has come to us. Lord Jesus, you taught about the Good Samaritan. We saw it as a story that didn't even have any application to us. But today, we want to take on this revelation and also be Good Samaritans in our lives. Thank you for the oil you have given us, the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the wine the blood that washes sins. We pray that we'll pour the oil and the wine into the lives of others. We'll live for others. We'll serve others. We'll risk our lives for others. We'll help others. We'll do the work of God so others can benefit from it. God bless you. All of you who are here, may the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord strengthen you. The Lord cause you to be strong and bless you. In your going, your going out and in your coming in, the Lord bless you and the Lord help you. And as you determine to live your life for others, may the blessing that comes upon those that the, the, the king even brings into his eternal kingdom, may such a blessing come upon you even in your lifetime. In the mighty name of Jesus. The Lord bless you. May God also think about you. May God also put you on his heart. May God also risk his life for you. May he risk his reputation for you. May God also bless your life. May God also interrupt his journeys to solve your issues for you. In the mighty name of Jesus. The Lord bless you in all your ways. In Jesus name. Amen. Let us give the Lord a mighty hand clap. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Beautiful. Are you glad you heard such a word? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? It's the good Samaritan spirit that makes us do the area fellowships. Some of us become leaders because we want to be good Samaritans for others. Pouring in the oil and the wine. 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 You want my notes? I could have actually faxed it to you or emailed it to you if you wanted. You can take some, I can see some people are taking photos of their notes. Beautiful. May you pour in the oil and the wine. Oil and the wine. Oil and the wine. You will live for others. That's why some people have hosted uh, area fellowships in their homes. Because I'm a good, uh, it's not my children. It's not my friend. They are not my biological brothers or sisters. But I want to open my home so that somebody can receive oil and, oil, uh, and, and, and wine. Oil and wine. I like the part about oil and wine. Oil and wine. Tell somebody oil and wine. Oil and wine. We are going to share oil and wine. Oil and wine. Oil and wine. Hallelujah. And this church, this service, we are going to do our best. Look, visiting, uh, inviting people to church, witnessing. One of these Sundays, when we finish, we, we, even, we won't finish. We'll break up. We'll go and bring, go to, uh, to the areas, bring people and continue the service. Yes, we will do it. Yes. Will you do it or not? God will help us. Cry for Jesus one more time. That's why we have people in the Bible school. I want to also live my life for others. I was on my road, on my journey to my career, but I can interrupt it, go to Bible school, get trained so I can be a blessing to others. I can preach to others. I can help others. Oh, there are so many things that are happening powerfully. May God bless you as you serve others 
In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, as every head is bowed, every eye closed, if you are here today, somebody invited you, but you are not a born-again Christian. When we say born again, we mean that you have not seriously opened your heart to take Jesus as your personal savior. As every head is bowed, every eye closed, I want to pray for you. Please lift up your right hand so I can pray for you quickly. Anybody here, you want to give your life to Jesus, lift it up, don't be shy. God bless you. Anybody, don't, God bless, don't put it down. God bless you. Anybody else? Maybe you came with your friend, but you are not born again, but today you want to say, Pastor, I want to be serious. I want to be a serious Christian. I want to be born again. Lift your hand up. Lift it up high. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Lift it up. God bless you. If you have lifted your hand, come to me right in front here. God bless you. Into my heart. Into my heart. God bless you. Come into my heart. Lord Jesus. and come. God can only help you. Lift up your two hands. Say after me, Heavenly Father, have mercy on me and receive me as your child. From today, I want to serve Jesus. I'll follow Jesus for the rest of my days. Please wash away all my sins. Forgive me all my sins and make me a new person. Please write my name in the book of life. I'm yours forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Michael, on my right, this way. Follow him. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.